We at TNT, of course, have followed the trials of Julian Assange, including reporting live from the Royal Courts of Justice in February. Many were dismayed, to say the least, by the recent judgment in which Julian had sought to be given leave to appeal extradition to the US. The judgment was bizarre and twisted at best and gave America three weeks to provide the High Court with assurances that they won't harm Julian because, of course, we'll believe them. I was joined last Friday by Julian's father, John Shipton. He said that we are watching death in slow motion, which is really a horrendous thought for a father to have to say about their son. But as he pointed out, it's been 15 years. John talked about the sheer volume of court hearings that his son has been through. And I am delighted today to be joined by someone who's been there. Um, witnessed some of the proceedings firsthand, in fact. Kathy Vogan from um, Consortium News. Kathy, good morning. You're an executive producer at Consortium, and uh, you're here to join us and talk through some really important witness statements that you have observed, as well as other things. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, Sonia. Uh, well, the one that you noticed was not a witness statement, of course, this time. This was just about the renewal appeal decision or should we call it an adjournment <laughs> more mm. an adjournment we'll decide mm. later uh, they found reasons to let julian go and they should have just said yes or no we accept or we deny um, mm -hmm. his right to appeal but they decided to give the americans another shot at these assurances and uh, this is the second round uh, there have been assurances already which don't assure at all but the testimony that you're referring to was from Maureen Baird. And Maureen Baird was an administrator of special administrative measures for the Bureau of Prisons. And that is the most awful form of solitary confinement, uh, absolutely permanent, 24 hours a day. She herself makes comments about that, that she doesn't know how they continue to get away with it because it is absolute torture for these people. It's a tiny little cell with nothing in there. They've got nothing to do and uh, they never get out. Um, even if they get to do a little bit of exercise, it's in a, a very similar room that's just next to their cell. And so basically they're not going to see any more human beings except perhaps eyes in the door or a hand coming through a slit in the door to give them food for the rest of their days. It's been described as a metal shoebox. And so she was one of the people in the extradition hearing. There were um, four main witnesses. This was uh, the 2020 extradition hearing, wasn't that's it? That's right. Because Yes. The, so this was the affidavits, right? And obviously, Bed was the former special administrative administrator. So yes. the way she you also just... testified in court, they got her in, and right. it was really it was really in re-examination by Mark Summers, who we know he was there at this last appeal hearing. Uh, it was in re-examination that the really terrible answer the answer that she gave made my heart sink because what he asked her was who decides who uh, goes under these special administrative measures is it uh, the judges is it the bureau of prisons no it's the cia oh and the cia are literally uh, together with the fbi are, are being accused of wanting to kidnap this man to harm this man I mean, it's just an actually egregious situation. Now, let me just let me just get position myself here. This was the hearing, right, where they were trying to prove that the name Nathaniel Frank was Assange. Is that correct? No, uh, that was uh, you're talking about the testimony and uh, affidavits from Patrick Eller, who was a forensic examiner. Right. In fact, he was a supervisor. Right. And he said in court that he was not even asked to prove there was no proof of who Chelsea Manning was talking to she never she never said who she was talking to she didn't know who she was talking to it was someone at WikiLeaks but it could have been any one of half a dozen different people um, and the strange thing is that Ellis said that the US didn't even ask him to prove who this Nathaniel Frank character was at the other end that name uh, is actually coming from Manning. The email address that was right. associated with was the actual username was Press Association. 
So right. nobody knows who that is, but it's just been stated so often that that person is Assange and they're just putting it in. And, and even Ella did it himself. And right at the end, Mark Summers said, excuse me, but you just said that that was, you said Assange. And he said, oh my goodness, no, absolutely. <laughs> there is, a, I have no idea who it was. So that wasn't Assange. You can't the, this is exactly it why it's so important. <laughs> this is exactly why, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. This is exactly why it's so important, though, to be able to talk to you, talk to you directly. So we get you, you know, your first person experience, because this is a story that has filtered down through the years. Right. And uh, and, and they, they still like to trot it out, don't they? Look, Kathy, let us go. Let's pick up some quick news headlines and we'll be right back. This is very interesting. Check this out. Now, TNT Radio News. Can you, can you say it? News. Matt Boyland here with a look at your TNT headlines. Civil servants overseeing the UK's weapons exports to Israel are threatening to stop work out of fear they could end up being complicit in war crimes in Gaza. 24-7, 365. We never stop sifting fact from fiction. Misinformation from the truth. From government overreach to the latest on mandates, big tech censorship to propaganda gone mad. Listen to TNT Radio and get the news and views direct from our expert presenters and commentators anywhere you go. Ask Alexa or Google to play TNT Radio or download the TNT Radio app for free from the App Store or Google Play. Today's news talk. This is TNT Radio. We are here with Kathy Vogan. It's absolutely wonderful because Kathy was has been there. She's been at uh, some of these insane court hearings to do with Julian Assange. And it's so wonderful because she's literally myth busting in real time. And I think that's so important around this case because a lot of it is about subterfuge, isn't it, Kathy? Making people believe that this man is something that he's not. And what you've just said immediately just nails an issue. And another issue that I think is really important for you to nail because you've drawn it to my attention and we need to draw it to the attention of our viewers. And that is... Point two one zero on on the judgment, right? Talk to us about it. Uh, well, two one zero is about uh, it relates to the CIA's kidnap or kill plot, and the judges comment that this was certainly terrible things and certainly enough to block an extradition, but they couldn't see anything that absolutely connected that with the proceedings, and so the rationale was, well. Yes, there was this threat of kidnap or kill by the CIA, but if we just hand him over so that he's in the custody of the justice system, then that threat of kidnap or kill falls away. But the vital point that they are missing is that when he's handed over, then, of course, it is the CIA that determines this terrible regime of solitary confinement the metal shoe box for the rest of his days it's the cia that decides so it's the you couldn't get a better example of what they call refoulement and that is handing back a refugee to the persecutors absolutely shocking stuff isn't it Kathy, who talked about the conditions being a fate worse than death well, that was a prison warden, a former prison warden called Robert Hood. And he is mentioned by one of the four expert witnesses, Joel Sickler. And he said, in fact, the full quote from him is that it is a fate worse than death, not fit for humanity. Special administrative measures he is talking to because yes. these people go mad they go absolutely mad they have no stimulation whatsoever they're only allowed one phone call for 15 minutes per month oh. to a nominated family member it's monitored and they're not allowed to say anything you know that they lose their privileges if they say anything there's a terrible story i mean i i don't need to go into too much detail it's awful but, but John Shipton was right when he said we're witnessing a slow death here of his son, wasn't he? He's absolutely right. Well, already he's in Belmarsh. He's in uh, conditions of um, not quite solitary because he's got his, um, well, yes, it's about 23 hours a day uh, from what I've heard. But the thing is, Stella and the children can visit him. But you rip somebody away from their country and you know it'd right. be it'd be very very difficult apparently it is very difficult even for family members to visit somebody who's being held in sams now 
the very first assurance that came, uh, because that was a bar to extradition, Julian was found to be likely to commit suicide if that was the fate that he was facing. But the US gave an assurance and said, no, he won't go to ADX prison under SAMS unless, and there's where they put the caveat in, unless he then does something to warrant such measures. And that's where the CIA can say, ha he looked at that prison guard the wrong way. Now he's going to oh, get Lord. SAMS. I mean, is it that loose? Is it that subjective? Well, you know, we heard another case, uh, David Mendoza, and there was a condition, he was Spanish, and the condition is that Spain doesn't want to separate people from their families. So the condition for his extradition, he committed some acts of fraud. He wasn't a violent man. And the US wanted him, and Spain said, all right, but you've got to send him back. Well, it was over a decade before they got him. They reneged on that. Uh, loose, of course. And in that case, there was a contract between Spain and the United States that he had also signed. There were three signatures on it. They photoshopped out his signature. But finally, he had to sue Spain. And he went to the Supreme Court twice. He won both times. And Spain, it came to the point that Spain threatened that they weren't going to process any more extradition hearings if they didn't send back David Mendoza. And finally, well, the US still took a bit of time, but finally they got him back, but it was over a decade. And wow. he was, they were supposed to be with his family, see his children grow up and be sent back straight away. I mean, this is really scary stuff. I would be extremely scared if I was, you know, related to Julian at this stage, because the reason why it's absolutely relevant what you're talking about from the 2020 hearings in terms of the testimonies of these prison experts is it because we're kind of back there again, aren't we? We're literally contemplating at this stage in a most awful political court case, but we are contemplating putting this man into the hands of people who we cannot trust him with, right? Well, actually, I would say that we've come a little bit further because um, Julian's Article 10 rights, so that's for freedom of speech, which is right. supposed to be equivalent to the First Amendment in America, right? Protects freedom of speech. It's the crown jewel of their constitution. So in the original ruling, the only ground that he won on and wasn't extradited on was health grounds. But now there is concern and that his freedom of speech will not be protected. Uh, this is the ruling that we've just seen, that he would be prejudiced against in the courtroom because he is foreign national. So his Article 7 rights are unlikely to be protected. That's about foreseeability of a crime. You've got to know something's a crime. That right. equates to Article right. 5 in the US Constitution. And finally, there's this business of the death penalty. Now, we didn't get anywhere with, um, you know, these uh, Article 10 with Judge Baraitza. And certainly with Justice Swift, he dismissed everything. But these two are very senior judges, and they're gravely concerned, and rightly so, because on June 29th, 2020, there was a ruling by Judge Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court. And this was the case of USAID versus Open Society. And it was about giving money to countries, but they were kind of gagged. They couldn't criticize the US. And they said, well, that violates our First Amendment rights. And, and the ruling from Kavanaugh is, you don't have any First Amendment rights. And it is a matter of long established law that foreign nationals outside the territory of the United States are not protected at all by the United States Constitution. So that's that makes it really, really difficult for the Americans to actually give an assurance that he will be protected by the First Amendment and not prejudiced against because he is a foreigner, uh, an Australian. And in fact, oh, well, that, um, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. That puts it in a slightly more positive light, actually. Yes, yes, that is very interesting. The death penalty, they've been really splitting hairs and the decision. They said, well, you know, it could be imposed, but this other assurance that he can go serve a sentence and eventually if he applies for it in Australia, 
that you know that, that this death penalty threat is against the spirit of that assurance. So this is what Ben Watson, KC, tried to argue, but the judges didn't really wear that. They said, well, maybe that would stop a death penalty from being carried out, but it certainly wouldn't stop the threat of a death penalty being imposed. Now, go figure the difference between the two, but mm. they're, really, they're really sticking on it. Well, I mean, it, it's usually a blanket decision, a black right. and white matter of law if there's a threat. If there's even a threat of the death penalty being imposed, Britain does not extradite. And Right, and exactly. Look. Listen, Cathy, before you leave us today, I mean, given your knowledge and understanding of this case and what you've witnessed firsthand, any idea what may be the outcome over the next couple of weeks? Uh, well, um, I think that, um, that the US may have a go at giving assurances. If they don't give assurances, then Julian's appeal goes ahead. Um, yes. and we don't know when that will be. But if they do um, give assurances, then both parties, see, that's the other thing. The defence, because of the timing of the previous assurances, they never got to challenge them in court. But that has changed now. And that's probably because of a, a decision, AAA versus the Home Secretary. And that's to do with the deportation of those refugees to Rwanda that the Home Secretary, it's not the Home Secretary's business to, to tell everybody if a country is safe. That must be right. tested in court. And right. so it, even though it's not being explicitly stated, um, it seems to be that that's what is happening. So they will have a debate about it. That they're, Both sides are invited to make submissions, but that would mainly be from the defence, and the defence will surely find um, problems with these promises' promises. Let's, and, let's indeed uh, hope so. Kathy, come back and join me, please, over the next few weeks when we get the, um, the, the verdict, the outcome of this and what America do. Really appreciate your input on this issue. It's so vital that we keep the, uh, the heat on this situation. Everybody, this is Kathy Vogan. She is from Consortium News, and she's been uh, giving us a brilliant insight on what has been happening throughout these various trials to do with Julian Assange. We'll be right back. <laughs> 